So here we are, I'm going to go pretty fast because I'm sure we're running a little behind. Um, so this is where we used to be um, 50 years ago or so. We used to have to look at the LA, um, looking at shadows in x-rays and clearly that wasn't helping us too much because you can only see it when it's crazy big. Um, so just going to talk about um, using MR um, to, to basically assess the the LA. Um, so here's some pictures from my research. This is 4D flow and you can see the pulmonary veins draining into the, the atrium and ventricle there and there's a, um, a uh, atrial myxoma uh, using conventional CINE MR. So these would be typical uh, data from an MRA. Um, so I routinely acquire an MRA at the start of my acquisitions and uh, it's not spinning but that's okay. You get the idea, so you get a very, very good look at the anatomy of the left atrium and you can detect any um, aberrant vessels um, and look at the relationships to other structures. It takes about 30 seconds, so it's quite time efficient. And here's a MIP projection, so I quite like these, most radiologists do, because in one view you can see all the connections and uh, any aberrant correct connect connections will pop out uh, very quickly using that kind of uh, method. And here we're just looking at a coronal view. I'm not sure how well that move is. Well, we're missing the atrium, that's very sad. Um, but anyway, MRAs are extremely useful, get similar anatomical information to that which you can get using um, CT angiograms that are adequately timed. There you go, we saw it. Um, so my favorite thing, looking at flow, um, so in particular, uh, using MRI as a technique to uh, flow audit. Um, and here, um, this is a patient who um, has, the question was, was there an AV fistula or anomalous drainage and was there a shunt? And the answer was no. And we did very careful two-dimensional flow measurements. You can see the circles we've drawn here. Oops, sorry. Uh, in, in miniature on the pulmonary veins. We don't normally do this on every case, but you can. Uh, and we've just done an audit of all the inputs. Um, we actually did at IVC and SVC as well, but you can see everything adds up to a few mils here and there, and that's um, one of the better cases, but usually it's um, plus or minus five mils, so it's pretty tight. Um, I think that must have had a heading. Okay, so this is a patient uh, who presented um, with exertional dyspnea. Uh, an external said elsewhere. Echo had seen an ASD, but... Um, at the institution referred to, they couldn't find it. Um, they had a, a CT which was reported as normal, uh, which it wasn't. And there's clearly an ASD, probably a, an inferior um, uh, sinus venosis type. Um, and they were sent to us to have a look at and quantify the, the shunt and to, um, well, at that point, they didn't realise there actually was an ASD. So we reviewed the CT um, afterwards and saw it, but we also saw it with, with MR. And you can see um, a hugely dilated um, right ventricle, about three times the left side, um, normal function, and a QPQS of 2.6. And here's our flow audit. Um, and you can see uh, massive flow through the pulmonaries, indicative of shunt. Um, and, and no evidence of um, anomalous drainage. Um, we did uh, 4D flow MRI. I'll show you some other pictures. I think this one's quite beautiful. Um, it shows flow from the SVC coming down uh, in purple and blue flow coming up from the IVC. They should be going into the RA and, and thence to the RV. And what you're seeing here is red flow uh, from the right um, pulmonary veins going direct through the LA, through the defect and straight into the RA and mixing. So you've got three primary flows all mixing in the RA more or less directly. It actually does this U-turn here. So that's all the left atrial flow flowing in. So that's, I guess, uh, 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 we'll just try and play this video. So this is the right, the normal right atrium flow as a comparator. I'm not sure how long that video is going to take. And you can see the normal flow is uh, nice and forms a nice vortex, if that plays. And um, here we've been able to map out the differences in that flow. I'll just let that go through before we skip on. Well, let's not. So, um, so in summary, yes, so um, 
MR's excellent for uh, quantifying the anatomy. You can do that with CT as well. With MR, you can also look at the flow patterns. So a lot of interest in using MR for imaging um, atrial scar, um, pre or post ablation. And there's an example. You can see the, the, the tissue in white coming up. Um, this is uh, what we call a, a publication-style picture. Everyone's best picture goes into the publication and are quite different often to what you see in real life. Um, it, it is a real thing. You, you can image atrial scar. The question is how reliably and routinely you can do that and is it relevant to clinical practice yet? Because it clearly will be. Um, and so the decaf study... Um, I think conclusively show that it is a real thing. It will be with us some time. It's probably not now, because I think the key sentence in that publication is performed at a core laboratory, and that is one core laboratory in Utah um, that can do these analyses very, very reliably. And this was a, a big 15 centre study trial, so um, I think it's quite strong evidence and, and shows a, a clear benefit um, to, to knowing what the atrial scar is in terms of predicting um, recurrence of AF. So on to CT. I'm sure there was a picture there. Uh, as I said, CT is excellent for doing volumes. So in common with MR, you can get very accurate gold standard left atrial volumes. Um, you can look for aberrant drainage or connections. Uh, you can look for clot. Uh, you can do work up before pulmonary ablation, uh, so pulmonary vein ablations, and you can import the data to guide the procedure live. So both techniques are equally good at that. Um, the nice thing about CT is it's so available and so quick, and if you've got an experienced team, you can do very clever injections to show whatever anatomy or relationships you want and do multi-phase studies to do that. Um, sadly, I think this, this might take too long to run through, this was a case from PA that was sent to us. It was a young lady who was, um, had, had had a pulmonary AVM in the past that had been coiled and wanted to get pregnant again. And the question was, uh, uh, there was a strongly positive bubble study, but no one could find uh, where it was coming from and was there another uh, pulmonary AVM. And um, there is. I'm not sure how easy that is to see, but... Um, when you play around with it a bit and look at it properly, uh, it is quite an obvious um, pulmonary arterial venous connection and there's the, the connection. So she's actually, she actually had a small stroke um, and we're going to go in and um, I think Mike's going to facilitate um, coiling that. Um, I think that's a duplicate. So just one final uh, comment, which is uh, pretty relevant, I think, to some of the, the information in the last talk. This is a, a recent paper from CERC, um, and it's very interesting to me because um, it, basically what they did is they looked at quantifying the, the extent of mitral regurgitation using MR, and that's something we do routinely. Um, but I've been uh, somewhat shy about uh, being too bullish about these volumes and often... Uh, historically have deferred to echo when clearly you're doing mild, moderate and severe. But the reality is with, with MR you get a number. Uh, it may be inaccurate depending on how good you are at the measurements. And the way you get the measurement uh, in a basic sense is you do the volumetric LV stroke volume versus the forward flow in the aorta. And in the absence of any AR you can work out the degree of MR. Um, and it's quite accurate if you're very careful. I, I suspect most sites aren't. But this is an Oxford study. They were very careful and they showed a clear survival advantage uh, for patients um, uh, in whom uh, a certain volume of mitral regurgitation predicted and the threshold was 55 mils. Uh, they indexed it, but it came around to 55 mils. And I guess the, the take-home from me was that, was that maybe we should be a bit more aggressive about... Um, in our reports, putting forward some of these objective measures of, of measurements like MR or left atrial volume, um, uh, because they probably do have prognostic um, value that should be guiding clinical management, and we need to start doing the trials to really validate that. Um, just to finish, um, this is an area of great interest to me. Um, so you're seeing there we've coded um, 
flow into the atrium in blue and flow after it's entered the LV in red um, with 4D flow data. So we're very, very interested in quantifying this behaviour and looking at early diastolic dysfunction, looking at stasis in the LA, um, and looking at velocity changes in regions like the appendix. And you can see uh, down the bottom there's a histogram uh, which shows a clear difference in average velocity between patients with AF and without AF, um, which is a, kind of an interesting application. So uh, just quickly in summary, um, CMR and uh, CT both are very good for looking at volumetric and anatomical um, issues with the LA. Uh, additionally, you can quantify flow uh, in, a, uh, in a very precise manner with MR and particularly precise with 4D flow, um, which is still a work in progress in terms of most clinical sites. Atrial scar is definitely a real thing. Um, I think we're not quite there in terms of delivering it yet. Um, I meant to put in a beautiful slide from James Moon uh, applying a motion correction algorithm uh, via a technique called Gadgetron, um, which I think is the way forward in terms of imaging the atrial wall because you need to motion correct because it's a thin structure and it moves a lot, so it's quite hard from an imaging point of view. And I think moving forward we need to be a bit more serious about uh, getting continuous numbers and, and doing the background research to guide clinical management with um, metrics from the atrium. Thanks very much.